Hey everyone, as promised, I'm back here with a little special supplement video this weekend where I'm going to talk over um, some of the stuff related to the homework for Chapter 3 and for Chapter 5. Um, and I'm going to call some audibles here because um, no one posted anything on the discussion thread for setting up this video for Chapter 5. And all I have to talk about from Chapter 3 is some stuff about validity, which I'm going to do. Um, but I might also throw in some extra stuff just, just for fun. Um, stuff that I have uh, remember working with students in the past about of like sort of interesting problems and, and good uh, paradigmatic or illustrative cases for, for stuff that's important preparation for the exam. So this probably won't be that long of a video. Um, if I had more requests, I would definitely make... I answer all of them. Um, I'm kind of sad that this device has not worked out the way I intended. I was anticipating more posts of like, what about this question? Or what about this problem? And I uh, haven't had that so far. So I'll still, um, I'm not going to give up on it just yet, because uh, it could very easily still happen with chapters to come. Um, but uh, for right now, I don't have much to work with. So it is what it is. All right. So let's start with the one thing that was asked about explicitly, um, validity, and some more examples about it. I posted a reply to someone's question uh, about validity, um, but then there was another request for doing some more examples, and specifically related to this um, exercise uh, from, I think it's this one right here, yeah, this is from chapter three, where you had this little true-false thing about uh, where it's testing your understanding of the kind of principal definition of validity. Again, I'll, I'll give you that uh, reminder right now. So, arguments are valid if and only if it's impossible for all the premises to be true and the conclusion false at the same time. So, the other way of saying that is uh, an argument is valid if and only if, if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. Those, those two expressions mean the same thing, but the way to evaluate validity is, at least until we started this whole formal logic unit with chapter 6, was to use our imagination to try to come up with those counterexamples to an argument's validity, a case where all the premises are true and the conclusion false. If um, I, I like that first definition of validity more, the one that says an argument is valid if and only if it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. So basically, it's valid if there are no counterexamples. So to disprove that, to say the argument is not valid, all you got to do to show that it's not impossible is to find a single case where it is possible. And that would show that it's not impossible. So that's how we are, we are approaching it. But it, it may um, take some special cases here uh, to illustrate just how far that goes and that things are really as simple as that sounds. The basic procedure for checking validity is just, can I come up with a counterexample, a case where all the premises are true and the conclusion false at the same time? If you can, the argument is invalid. If you can't, the argument is valid. But I, I like this exercise, this true-false exercise for trying to, like, um, really mostly convince you that you don't need to be thinking about whether the premises are actually true or false, and that you, you really shouldn't be thinking about that at all when evaluating validity. So let's do some illustrations of this. Um, most of these claims are actually false. So the first two, every argument with a false conclusion is invalid. That's false. You can have valid arguments that have actually false conclusions. Um, every argument with a false premise is invalid. That's also false. You can have valid arguments with actually false premises. Because the question is about what happens if the premises are true. And let me give you an example, and then the third one actually we should wrap in here too. Every argument with both false premises and false conclusion is invalid. No, you can have a valid argument with all that. And to illustrate that, take a look at this example. And I brought this one up in my other lecture, but I thought I'd draw it all out here again and talk it through so you can see how this is working um, really directly. So I have the, this argument here, all wines are whiskeys, ginger ale is a wine, ginger ale is a whiskey. In the actual world, every single one of those claims is false. It's not true that all wines are whiskeys. In fact, no wines are whiskeys. <laughs> ginger ale is not a wine in the actual world, and ginger ale is not a whiskey in the actual world. So these claims are all false. But what happens if the premises were true? Let's just assume, for the sake of argument, all wines are whiskeys. Okay, I can imagine that. Here's everything that counts as a wine is in the category of counting as a whiskey. 
And now let's imagine ginger ale is a wine. So I put ginger ale in the wine category. If those two things are, tr are both imagined as being true, can I imagine, is it possible for me to imagine that ginger ale is not a whiskey? No, uh, it, it isn't. When I try to put this counterexample together, premise is true, conclusion false, the answer is no, I, I, I can't make that happen. And if the answer is no, then that means it's valid. If I could have come up with this counterexample, if there's a yes answer here, then it's invalid. But as it stands, can't do it. So this argument serves as a counterexample for all the first three claims in the homework. It has actually false premises, but it's still valid. It has an actually false conclusion, but it's still valid. And it has actually false premises and conclusions simultaneously, and is still valid. Um, so, going back here. That disproves one, two, and three. How about this one? Every argument with a false premise and a true conclusion is invalid. Well, that's not necessarily the case either. Um, and we have another example here. False premise, true conclusion. Here we go. And I know that my webcam is going to be in front of this, so let's move it up here. There we go, right there. I have it all prepared. So all wines are whiskeys. That's premise, uh, first premise here. Ginger ale is not a whiskey, so we got it outside of the whiskey category. Okay, So we have all wines are in the whiskey category, and ginger ale is not a whiskey. So therefore, ginger ale is not a wine. Can I imagine the premises true and yet the conclusion false? No, I can't. I can't get a counterexample. Um, so this argument is valid. And it has an actually true conclusion with false premises. Is it true that all wines are whiskeys? No, not actually true. Ginger ale is not a whiskey? No. Um, oh, wait, actually, that, that part's true. But you still have one false premise here, right? All wines are whiskeys, that's not true. But we have a true conclusion here. Ginger ale is not a wine. Um, so that can happen, too. So we have, a false, we have a false premise and a true conclusion, and it's still valid. So that shows that this claim is false. How about this one? Every argument with true premises and a false conclusion is invalid. That's actually true, but it's only because of this. When we're trying to come up with these counterexamples, right? Um, let's go back here. I'm asking, is it possible to get all the premises true and the conclusion false at the same time? Well, check this out. Let me do another thing here. Here's a circle that represents everything that is logically possible. This was the notion of possibility that we said was relevant for evaluating validity. So here's everything that's logically possible. The actual world, if you will, the, the world of what is actually true is in this category. So here's our world. It is, the actual world is a possible world. It couldn't, you couldn't have the actual world out here as something logically impossible um, because it couldn't happen. Right? So whatever is actually true is also possibly true. So if in the actual world the premises are true and the conclusion false, then there's your possible counterexample. That the fact that it's actually working out that way means that it's possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false at the same time. Now, the, the, I want to say one more thing to just make it super explicit here. This might You might already be kind of gathering this, but just to make it super explicit. Wow, it is true that every argument that has actually, whoa, what happened? Well, something goofy happened there. Okay, so while it's true, this is the thing I want to emphasize. While it's true that every argument with actually true premises and an actually false conclusion is invalid, this isn't how, somehow better than other counterexamples. So uh, we were talking about this in that last lecture about uh, George Washington dying, right? Uh, if George Washington was beheaded, then George Washington died. George Washington died, therefore George Washington was beheaded. Now, I came up with a really goofy counterexample uh, where the premises are true and the conclusion false by having uh, George Washington get abducted and killed by aliens. Um, but he actually died of... Oh, shoot. Um, <laughs> Neil told me about this in the last video, and I thought I'd remember for sure. It was something like... Oh, I can't remember what it was. It was some maybe some kind of cancer. I think it was throat cancer or something like that that he said. So in the actual world, the premises were true 
and the conclusion false. But what actually happened to George Washington as a way to disprove that argument's validity is not somehow rationally better than my goofy, he got abducted by aliens example. And that's the point. Validity is just about what's possible. It's not dependent on what's actually true. Um, so this whole exercise here was really trying to just really pound that in, really emphasize that point, that you, you, if you catch yourself, if you're thinking about whether arguments are valid or invalid, and you catch yourself thinking about what's, what you know is actually going on in reality, you're just you're barking up the wrong tree. It's not. It may work out just because of five here, but that's not something to bank on. That's not the way that you're supposed to approach it. Okay, let's talk about soundness a little bit too, since we're here. Every argument with a true conclusion is sound. That's false. Um, and the reason that that's false is that soundness requires the argument to be valid and have all true premises. Could you have a true conclusion where that's not happening? Yeah, pretty easily, right? True conclusions can still be, um, like in uh, this example here, right? Ginger ale is not a wine. That's true. But it doesn't have all true premises. Um, we have this premise, all wines are whiskeys. So it's not satisfying the conditions for soundness. This was a valid argument, so we had val validity was checked off, but it didn't have all true premises. So it's not sound, even though it has a true conclusion. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and there's other examples we could create too. You can have invalid arguments that have true conclusions. Um, so the, that the conclusion is in fact true really proves nothing about the argumentation that's being offered to support it. And that's really the upshot of, of reflecting on that problem, is that uh, the truth of the result doesn't tell you anything about how rational or reasonable is the argument being offered to support it. People give bad arguments for good beliefs or true beliefs all the time. Uh, people can believe something that's actually true, but on really bad grounds. Um, and people can have really good reasoning for things that are ultimately false. That's what we'll be getting into when we do inductive reasoning, because it's inductive reasoning, the chapter 8, 9, 10 stuff, that's all about fallible reasoning. We can always be wrong. Like Even our best scientific efforts can be false, and we've seen in the history of science how many times that's happened, right? Where we were doing really good work. It wasn't like we did something wrong or irresponsible, but we just were ignorant of some stuff. So we got a false conclusion. So good reasoning still could have a false conclusion. And you can also have bad reasoning for true conclusions. So that might lead you to think like, well, then what's the point of reasoning or defending things with argument or something? And the reason is that it gives you a better chance of doing that. right? It, it's a part of true seeking. We want to set ourselves up with the best chance of getting at the truth and if we're in a lucky position to be able to know something it still is good to know like why it's true um, i think this is especially the case in ethics i don't want to get on a huge tangent here but if you ever want to talk to me about this i am an ethicist so i've always got ethics on the brain and it, it i'll just say right now and if you want to talk we could do it more but i always say um that in ethics what we value or what we think is right and wrong like what's good behavior the what's of it can be um, just as imp or the the whys of why something is right or wrong can be just as important as the what's involved. Um, it's not just a matter of the what's, uh, but why we value things, what's the basis on which we value it, is something meaningful in and of itself. Um, if people live moral lives but only because they're afraid of the cops, that's different than if people live moral lives because they have a genuine value or concern or interest in how other people are doing for their own sake. Like those are just worlds apart in my mind in ethics. It's not just about the behavior. Um, but anyway, that's a, that's a tangent. If you want to talk more about it, we can. But soundness is just saying you meet both of these conditions. An argument is sound if it is valid and has all true premises. If either one of these two conditions is not being met, then it's not sound. But we can do some cool stuff here about uh, what soundness means. And uh, so I'm going to here go here and make another argument. And this will get us into the last problem here. It said, every argument with a false conclusion is unsound. That's interesting. Okay, let's take a look. That's actually true. But why is it true? All right, I'm going to make a little argument here. Let me put my microphone down for a second.
All right, check out this argument. Uh, make it nice and pretty. So we're let's imagine a um, a particular argument here. So maybe I should have reworded this to be like claim three is saying if the premises of this argument are true, then the conclusion of this argument is true, and that just means to say that the argument is valid. Okay, um, and then if we say so, that's this part, right? Valid. We might say check okay if premise if uh, claim three here is true then that means we've got validity covered and then if claim two is true if the premises of this argument are true well that's what we're asking for for all true premises so you put three and two together that's basically the conditions for soundness and notice the conclusion is true this is a valid argument we've started doing the chapter six material so i'm almost tempted to put this into symbolic logic um this is like saying, uh, if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. The premises are true, therefore the conclusion is true. This is a valid argument. We can we could actually, once we start doing truth tables, I could prove to you that this is, uh, this is valid. It's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. But you can just take it on my authority right now. That is definitely a valid argument because it is one of the core argument forms of formal logic. It's called modus ponens and whoa 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 I hit the caps lock there and I've actually mentioned this argument form a couple times but this is definitely valid so what it shows is that if these two premises are true the conclusion must be true so if you have a sound argument one where these two things are in fact true then every sound argument must have a true conclusion. And that's why we like soundness so much. Soundness is cool because if you've got a sound argument, you know the conclusion is true. There's certainty right there. It depends on both of those conditions being met, and that's where we get into controversy and disagreements with each other. Like, do you think this is a good argument or do you think it's a bad argument? Uh, are you convinced by it or not? Well, well, we might dispute it on is it really valid? Does it ha actually have all true premises? Should we endorse those premises as being true? That's where we get into debates. But if both of those things are met, then we'd have a necessarily true conclusion. So you can never have an argument that's sound and doesn't have a true conclusion. And that's what it means to say here that every argument with a false conclusion is unsound. That's correct. Okay, so that's some stuff about uh, validity and soundness and stuff. Before I left this video behind, I did want to talk a little bit about stuff from Chapter 5. Again, no one asked any questions, but I thought I'd just preempt some of these. Um, I really like uh, a couple of these problems here. In particular, I just want to point something out about number 6 here is another one of these um, arguments that's a little more complicated. So it's getting a little closer to what you might see on the last couple problems of the exam. If you remember in a video I sent out before, uh, I mentioned arguments can be complicated not because they have complicated claims, but that they just have lots of them and there's a more complicated argumentative structure going on here. And that's what you get here. All these claims are pretty straightforward. Um, Joe is not a freshman. Joe lives in a fraternity. Freshmen are not allowed to live in fraternities. Joe is not a senior. He is, uh, Joe has declared a major. Every senior has declared, these are just a bunch of, there's a lot of premises here. There's a lot of claims in standard form. Um, but they're all individually pretty easy to piece out, and you actually probably don't even need to rephrase any of these. They're, this is where copy-paste methods would work just fine, no problem. Um, but when you put them together, uh, you're going to get a more complicated structure. Uh, in fact, let's just... Uh, you, know, you saw the diagrams I had from giving out the homework answers. Um, but it is going to have this structure of... Whoop, here's one big argument for a conclusion claim. They, they have actually... This is a big process of elimination thing. Oops. So it's going to look like this... But then we actually need a helper premise in here. So they're saying, uh, let's go back to it here. Joe is not a freshman. Uh, oh, the final conclusion is Joe must be a sophomore. We have a conclusion marker, really nice. So Joe must be a sophomore. Why is that the case? Well, so Joe's not a sophomore. Why? Well, he's not a freshman. He's not a junior. He's not a senior. And 
the suppressed premise here, if this is a process of elimination, you need a premise that says something like, Joe is either a freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior. But then the other thing I really like about this one as an example is that you get a bunch of supporting arguments too. So all of these, let me just, uh, all of these claims here also have their own supporting arguments. So if you had used the backwards method here that I've been teaching about how to reconstruct arguments, this would have been a problem where it would have been very helpful to do so, to like stay oriented and not get confused about which claims are supporting which other claims. Because there, there's quite a lot of argument markers in here, but those argument markers don't tell you uh, which where exactly those arrows go right in the superstructure. So using the backwards method would have figured that out for you. Sorry for the interruption there. My uh, parents arrived at the cabin. Um, okay, so that's a, that was just a, a problem I wanted to point out as, uh, as a good, good example of what you might have to do. Even with a simpler problem, um, it, watching for suppressed premises and sub-arguments and stuff like that is a really good thing to do. Um, okay, and then one more thing I'll, I'll call an audible on here. I really like exercise six and giving you some practice of like, when do you, I mean, here you, you're told explicitly, you got to watch out for suppressed premises. They're there. You just need to catch them. So none of these answers should read as there are no suppressed premises. There's some for all of these. And there's a few I really like uh, to usually go over with students. Um, some of them are pretty straightforward, like that's not modern poetry. Why? Because you can understand it. So suppressed premise, you can't understand modern poetry. Again, you're taking the explicit premise that's being offered and figuring out like what help does it need in order to be able to count as a reason a good decent reason for the conclusion maybe not a guarantee but um but at least that it has some kind of rational weight rather than being obviously bad but the one i really like here is this one number six there must not be any survivors since they would have been found by now and one of the things i really like about this one is not only it's a little like requires you to piece things together a little bit. The suppressed premise isn't just like slapping you in the face, but also that it can't, you can't really copy paste this one to put it into standard form. So let's, let's actually, let's actually do this one together. I mean, you've seen the answer probably, but think about it like this. There are no survivors since they would have been found by now. You get a nice reason marker, explicit argument marker since gives you a reason. So, you know, the first part's the conclusion. Oh, that's annoying. I'm not going to do that. So we've got, as the conclusion, there are no survivors. Okay, there we go. And we're going to put the, we'll just do this really quick. Blammo. And then the, the explicit premise that we're given is they would have been found by now. But just putting, they would have been found by now here, like if I just like typed it in here, like this. Oops. <laughs> this is not a complete sentence. This isn't a complete claim. They would have been found by now. What? What's going on? Survivors would have been found by now. What's really happening here? What the if you if you took a step back, and you're like, okay, what is what's the argument of appeal that the person is making? Um, it, there's a kind of we need to maybe flesh this out, have it sit as a claim all by itself. Then I think you get something like this. You kind of remember that you've got this um, artistic license to rephrase points to draw out what their idea is by saying they would have been found by now. They're really saying if there were, if there are, yeah, let's say were, that's a little more grammatically correct. If there were survivors, we would have found them by now. Now notice, this is not valid. If this premise is true, this could still be false. It could be true that if there were survivors, we would have found them by now, and we have found a bunch of survivors, so there are survivors, right? That could have happened. So in order for this to count as a good reason for the conclusion, we need to have the suppressed premise, we have not found any survivors yet. 
or let's just say by now. Let's keep the language consistent. That's good. We have not found any survivors by now. If there were survivors, we would have found them by now. So there are no survivors. This is a lot easier to spot as a suppressed premise if you rephrase the explicit premise that was offered in the problem in a way that stands alone all by itself um, in standard form. So that's why I like this one. I find that students who are used to doing the copy pasting and just sticking to that, they have some trouble with some of the problems on the exam. So this is this is really good to have under your belt. Okay, um, there were I, there's other things I could talk through, but um, no one asked anything, so I'm not going to do that. And the the uh, homework answers are out there for you. Um, certainly. If you end up having questions and you miss this cutoff or just forgot to post them or something like that, you're still always free to contact me and talk to me over the phone or email. I definitely, if, if things are confusing, if my answers don't make sense or you're not sure what to do with these problems yourself um, or the procedure steps you should follow for executing on these analytic tasks that you're being asked to do for the exam, please reach out to me somehow and let me help you out. I, I told you I'd be a broken record about this. Every single time I see you <laughs> or make a video or something, I mention this. So uh, I, and I will keep doing that because right now, this quarter, uh, students are not reaching out to me as, as much as I think should happen. There's a bunch of students who I've never even heard from once. So if you're one of those students, it's never too late to start. <laughs> I'm definitely going to be happy to talk to you no matter what. Um, so you can trust that. Okay, I hope this video was helpful. Um, I'll see you next time for doing more logic. Bye.